I'm from uh, North Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, born and raised, uh, born and raised there. Moved away a few times, but always came back, and uh, uh, that's where I grew up, and that's where I was when I enlisted in the in Air Corps in World War II. Oh, I was a flight engineer, a gunner. I uh, I enlisted in uh, in North Little Rock uh, at it. Uh, the Camp Robinson, it's still there, mm -hmm. and uh, stayed there maybe two days, and uh, they outfitted us in uh, armored clothes. Then we got on a train and went to uh, Fort Worth, Texas. I enlisted under a, 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 a little program they had going, or, or a campaign that the governor had going. They wanted 2,000 young men from Arkansas to enlist in Air Corps and go to Fort Worth, Texas, and they're going to be known as the Arkansas Liberators. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Anyway, we went to Fort Worth, Texas and spent the night, and next morning we got up and fell in, uh, in order, and they called a roll, and everybody was there, and they put us on a train and shipped us to Big Springs, Texas. And that was the end of the Arkansas Liberators. <laughs> Nobody ever heard of it since, but it was in the paper. I got the clipping, so it was uh, it, it was authentic. But uh, and then from from uh, Big Springs, they shipped me down to Kelly Field, and Kelly Field was was filled up, so they put us outside the fence up on a little old knoll, and uh, drove a truck full of tents up there and put them out. And we established a little tent city. We pioneered it. Today, that's Lackland Air Force Base. So we, we were actually pioneers, and we, we, had, uh, we had our own. Here's the way it started. They'd bring a truckload in, and they'd, they'd put up a few tents. And I think there was four or maybe five to a tent. After we got, a, after we got maybe a contingency of uh, 50 people, they said, who can cook? Anybody cook more than, for more than six people? Oh, yeah, yeah, I used, the guy said, I, I cooked at a deer camp. You know, we had 15 or 20 in a deer camp. Well, that's fine. Said, uh, uh, we'll let you be a cook. And that's the way they got them. Ate, ate out of a field kitchen, cleaned, uh, cleaned our mess kits and a 55 gallon drum that we heated and got the water hot. And we lived like that from, uh, October until uh, the end of December. And then they sent us down to Gulfport, Mississippi for a mechanic school. And that's where I received my schooling in uh, airplane mechanics. I didn't want to fly. If I'd wanted to fly, I'd try to get into the cadet program. But uh, I had an older brother that was killed flying in Texas, and I, I, I told my mother I wasn't going to fly. After I got out of mechanical school, they sent me to Willow Run, Michigan. As a Ford Motor Company had a B-24 factory there, a huge factory. When I finished training there, they made a, made a flight engineer out of me. <laughs> sent me to Laredo, Texas, to gunnery school. While in gunnery school, Laredo, Texas was primarily set up for a B-24 gunnery school because they had B-24 turrets. The rest of the rest of the schools didn't necessarily have B-24 turrets. They could have turrets that was in like in a B-17 or a B-24, both. But this was primarily a B-24. And when I graduated from there, they uh, every time I went through school, they'd give me another stripe. So I reached, uh, reached the uh, staff sergeant status. And they sent me to, uh, to Salt Lake City, Utah. And that's where the bomber crews were formed. And that's when I met my crew. They just take take a pilot out of the pool, two of them a co-pilot and a pilot, and then they get a navigator and a, and a bombardier and a, and a gunner and a radio operator and engineer, and you brought them all together, and that was your crew. And I don't, I, everybody may have felt the same way, I don't know. But I don't believe I could have handpicked a better crew than those guys were. Everybody knew their job, and not only that, but they knew it well. So I think that's one, one of the reasons why we got through uh, like we did. We had a lot of problems, but we overcome them.
and I always believe it because of the crew. But uh, and I, and I was <laughs> I was always a little bit uh, uh, prejudiced about uh, the boys that went through factory school. I figured uh, the one the engineers that come out of the Willow Run, I thought they were the best engineers because they had watched the plane build from the from the ground up. So uh, that's not necessarily true, but that was just my thoughts about it. And after we got uh, after we got our crew farm, we uh, we were there. We were in Salt Lake City maybe a, a week or ten days. And it was awful. It was in the winter of '43, and it was cold. And uh, when I first got there, I had uh, one of the fellows that, or three of us kids that grew up together, enlisted together. And our mothers were close friends, and they just kind of talked back and forth and kept up with the three of us. So uh, while I was in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, the, they called me down to headquarters. And I uh, said, we have a phone call here for uh, giving me the number to call your cousin. Well, I had doubts about that because I didn't have a one cousin in uh, and, the and, and service, and he was in, in uh, Dutch Harbor, Alaska. So I didn't know what was behind that, but I went and called the number, and it was my buddy that I enlisted with. And uh, I said, well, why did you tell him he was my cousin? He said, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come over and get you. We're going to go on, on a three-day pass. I said, no way. I said, we're restricted, and we can't leave because we're forming a bomber crew. He said, I'll be over there. Sure enough, he went over, and he, he prevailed on him some way, and, and he got me an overnight pass. So we went to town. Well, he had been there a while, and he knew, knew the young ladies, so we went out on a party that night, out all night long, wandering around, walking through that snow and ice, and I wound up a strep throat. I was sick for a couple of days before we got ready to, to leave out, but we'd already formed a crew and I didn't, didn't want to go on sick call for fear they may put me in the hospital and I wouldn't be able to stay with the crew. So I toughed it out and uh, using the old remedy, you know, vapor rub, uh, Vic Save. They put us on a troop train and sent us down to Tucson, Arizona. Went from cold to good warm weather. When I got off the train in Tucson, I was running a high fever, and I had I had to go to the hospital, and they said I had had uh, strep throat. They put me in the hospital, and I was I was in there all ten days. And while I was in there, my crew was flying, and the pilot would come down about every other day and say, "When are you going to get out?" I said, "I have no idea." So he said, "You're going to have to get out." And get with the crew, or they're going to replace you. They're flying with an engineer every day, a different one. And I said, "Well, I'll go to the flight surgeon and, and talk to him and see what you can find out." And they came back, and he said, "The flight surgeon said that he's going to he'll release you tomorrow if you don't not run any more temperature." And sure enough, it all cleared up, and they discharged me out of the hospital. And uh, I went down. He said, I, "That's when sulfur." drugs first came out and uh, they were I was uh, taking a sulfur drug and it, uh, it, it turned your urine just as orange as it could be and, and the doctor said now when that clears up you can fly now what that had to do with flying I don't know but anyway, <laughs> anyway that, that, that is, as uh, President Dick, uh, Nixon said one time I want to be perfectly clear <laughs> about this you know <laughs> so anyway uh, uh, everything cleared up, and I got back, got with my crew, and they'd flown. They'd been flying about a week before I got with them. And then we uh, we left there and went to uh, McCook, Nebraska, and they formed the 493rd Bomb Group. After, tra after training there, we went overseas as a bomb, the last bomb group to go to Europe, intact. We flew uh, 36. Factory new B-24 Js went from went the northern route, you know, up through uh, Labrador and uh, Iceland over to uh, Valley Wales. We landed in Iceland and we had to do a pull a 25-hour inspection on our plane. We had to take the uh, 
oil screen out, clean it, water, you know, clean it up, put it back in, replace the oil, and that's about all you did on a 25 hour. And uh, on one of the engines, uh, uh, the factory put the little old plug in the sump, cross threaded it. We didn't know it, we backed it out, it stripped all the threads out. So uh, we were in, we had a little, had a pretty good little shop there, you know, on the, on the base. And I was, I had worked at the, I was on a, before I went to service, I was, was a machinist apprentice for the railroad. So I'd ran the lathe and I'd run boring mills. And I, I told them, I said, I'd, I'd, I'd make a plug. If, if you can find me a, a tap where I can tap, an oversized tap, I'll make a plug and we'll plug it. Oh no, you can't do that, no. So we'll fly a sump in from Presque Isle. So we sat around there three days waiting on a sump to come in. All this time our buddies are coming in, drifting through, you know, drifting through and y'all come on, come on. Uh, we can't go anywhere, so we got to wait to get a sump. So the sump finally came in and uh, we put the sump on and we got over there Well, most of the guys were, had beat us to Debbie's. Went to a little place called Debbie's England, right out of Ipswich. And that was the beginning. They took our new planes, they left us with a few new planes. Most of them they took them out and took them to some kind of a distribution point and they meted them out to different bomb groups. And we got, we got these war rear planes back in for replacements. And that was the beginning of, of being in England. Last of April or 1st of May, 44. And we, about all we did was fly around and get uh, uh, custom, customary, you know, the, the land, the lay of the land. We were close to, uh, to the channel, right off the uh, Ipswich estuary, which was a good mark to come into England. You could, if you ever come in where the estuary was, you could just drift right on around to Debbie's. It was a real good landmark. So we had to get the lay of the land, flying around and learn to fly a little formation over there and another bunch of flying a bunch of signal and uh, until D-Day. Well, they called us up, come in that morning and uh, woke us up and and uh, I had a good friend of mine uh, that was a Lithuanian. He had kind of a uh, Lithuanian accent. We were standing out there waiting for the truck to pick us up, take us down to the chow hall, and we could hear this, these guns. But it was drift, you know, drizzly rain. He said, uh, I said, can you hear that thunder? I said, man, that's not thunder. I said, that don't sound like the oil, that's thunder, you know. I said, no. Nah. But anyway, it was just a boom, a roar, boom. You know. So we went to chow and ate, had breakfast, and that breakfast went into interrogation. And uh, they said, uh, uh, pull the curtain back and said, gentlemen, today is we're invading, invading Europe. So that was the big guns, the battleships, and everything on it. But everybody, ooh and ah, ooh and ah, we hadn't flown a mission. We've been waiting to fly. Everybody wanting to fly, you know. So we got our chance. Flew to a little place called La Sous, France, right in land from from Normandy, is in the Normandy area. And uh, it's a marshaling yard. But we couldn't drop because of the undercast. And on the way back, we had two, two planes to fly together and over the channel, crashed over the channel. And one of the, one of the crews was a pilot name was Cooper. And he was a, a experienced crew that I think they were on, a, I think they'd flown 20 some odd missions and they came to our group to kind of well, let's kind of let they go on. they were going to lead lead the group and we kind of fall in with them because they were experienced in the combat and we lost two of them thought we lost uh, two crews but uh, later on uh, many years later uh, come to find out one of them survived we picked up it picked up at sea and he came to one of our meetings, just like the meeting we have here. Just how the, they got in, they were got into a discussion said about our bomb, the, the, some of the bomb members, uh, bomb crew members said, that, did, they, did they 
crash, did they fly together going over or was it coming back? Well, one, one faction would say, oh, it was going over, and then they're always coming back. And this guy stood up and said, I can answer that because I'm the guy, I was in one of the planes. So he, he straightened out. We didn't even know he survived. That was, uh, that was D-Day. No opposition. No fighters, no flak. We came back, you know, and said, uh, well, this is going to be a snap. I went down to the little headquarters and I told him, I said, if anybody needs a, somebody to fly for someone that's sick, I said, put my name on that availability list. I'll fly, you know. So one day we come in, I, we flew two missions. And then the third day, we, the third day that we stood down, we we're going to fly. Well, they called me to fly in a, as a replacement. So it happened, the crew was in my hut. And uh, the engineer was sick, so I flew as engineer on that crew. We, we flew, we left out of there with a, a load of 24-hour delayed bombs. And we didn't get over Europe, we didn't get over the continent, and they recalled us. The weather was bad, and they recalled us and told us to go up in the North Sea and, and uh, drop the load. So we flew up in the North Sea and dropped the load and come back and landed. Well, from you know, you get up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock, and it takes you about 45 minutes to an hour to assemble. Then you fly out, and then you got to fly back. So we didn't get back home, you know, late in the morning. I, that's that three minutes in a row. I was wore out. I went in, I hit the sack, you know, and, and uh, the guy said, oh, we're going, we're going to town. Come on, go with us. So I got up, didn't get any sleep. We went to town and had a, had a, had a big party, come back, and then we got back. We was on, on alert for, to fly the next morning with my crew. And then I was war smack dab out, and I went down to the uh, flight surgeon, and I said, Could you give me something to keep me awake. So he gave me, I, I think it was, Bends are drilled or bends or something. Well, them eyes stay open. You wore out, but those eyes would stay open, you know, and just, you couldn't close them. And, and the pilot knew there was something wrong, and I walk around like a, you know, like a zombie. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, are you sick? And I said, no, I'm just, just tired, wore out. Well, why are you tired? He said, we hadn't, you know, hadn't flown, didn't fly yesterday. And I told him, I said, well, I flew as a replacement for one of the engineers, the guys in our in my hut, and he said, "Never do that again. If you do, you're off the crew. And you, if you're gonna fly with this crew, you're gonna be alert. You're not only putting yourself in jeopardy; you're putting all of us in jeopardy." And he, he was right about that. So I I went down and took my name, name off. The, I didn't even get credit for the mission. It wasn't, it wasn't a mission. We never got over the, over the uh, continent. So I, I didn't. I took my name off the list, and I didn't didn't, didn't do that anymore. A boy by the name of Billy Gamillion was a radio operator. He had his name on that list, and they flew. After this incident, uh, my incident, about two two flights next, two missions next, we flew to flew to uh, Fallersleben, and he flew as a replacement, and he was shot down and was killed. And my radio operator, he was a real good friend of my radio operator. And he said, well, if Billy would have stayed with his crew, he'd be alive today. I said, let that be a good lesson to you. I said, I, I, said, I absorbed every minute of it. And it will never happen with me again. But uh, it was something, a lot of people took it kind of superstitious, you know, and said, uh, if you don't, don't stay with your own crew, you're, something's going to happen to you. And in that case, it did. We had a lot of... A lot of missions we flew and, uh, and uh, you know, we shot up. That was, that was a common thing, you know, flak and uh, fighters, uh, fighters uh, occasionally. Fighters wasn't as bad then during my tour as it had been earlier. We had a lot of fighters, don't get me wrong, you know. We lost, we lost uh, nine planes out of one squadron. Nine out of 12 planes by fighters. Uh, right after I had my incident, uh, I flew to, uh, it's on September the 13th. We flew to Ludwigshaw in Germany to the IG Farman Chemical Works on a 
banks of the Rhine River. Uh, Mannheim's on one side of the Rhine and Ludwigshaven's on the other side. And right along the banks of the river, I, I would call it the southern banks, it might have been the western, but anyway, it had a huge complex, big place. Uh, and that was our target that day. I, had a lot, I don't remember just how many guns I had in any aircraft. We had fighters in the group, uh, in the area, but they wasn't on our group. We could see them at a distance on you know, a group ahead of us, hitting them, but they were swarming like you know, bees, and, but they wasn't on us right then. So it wasn't bother with fighters, but the flak was heavy. And uh, went over the target, and uh, a crew, the pilot named uh, uh, Vandertail, they were shot down over the target. And we had the number three engine shot out, and an 88 went right through the right wing through the number four fuel cell. Had a hole about that big around it, went right on up, right in the top turret. That thing went up, it looked like it might have been 500 feet or 1,000 feet and exploded. It didn't explode when it went through, it had been, had, had been the end of it, but it went on through, went up and exploded. And all that fuel, I transferred fuel just before we got to the target. I had 425 gallons of fuel in that tank. And that just sucked out. It looked like a, looked like a white foam, it looked like smoke. And that's the waste gunner said, we're on fire, and there were four engines on fire. And, uh, but I could smell the fuel, I could see the, the hole in the wing. But the fuel seemed like it's coming out of the bottom. But I could see the hole in the top where it you know, pushed out. And, uh, and the pilot said, uh, go down and see where the fire is. I, 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 said, I told him, I said, Lieutenant, it's not, it's not on fire. I said, we gotta, we're losing fuel. I said, go back and see what it is. Well, I, I crawled out of the turret and, and got a walk around oxygen bottle and put that on my mask and I went down through the bomb bay and back into the waste. And boy, it was, fuel was strong. I told those guys, I said, boy, don't, don't fire a gun, don't do nothing. Don't, and we smoked, you know, at, at altitude. And I said, don't make any kind of a spark or nothing. That thing go up like a bomb. And uh, they, a lot of them had fuel all over them at the waste, in the waste window, you know. So I went back up, got back up my turret, and I told the pilot, I said, well, it's fuel. I said, and, but the tank was empty. The time I got back up and got my turret, the tank was empty, and everything began to look kind of normal. But, but we lost that engine, it's starving. No fuel, couldn't get any fuel to it. I could transfer fuel over that tank, but the tank had a hole in it. Now, had we been in a B-24, at that time it was in 17s, had it been a B-24, I could have ran that engine off of what's called a cross feed. I could have sucked fuel out of any of the other tanks and ran it. So we lost two engines. And the fighters, like I tell you, was all in the area. So we kept trying to stay up with the group. And the other, the other two engines were beginning to overheat, and cut out. So they was cutting out, and then we'd cool them down, and they'd, they'd start running again, and then they'd cut out. So we continued to lose altitude. Finally, we was on, on our own. We began to throw out everything we had and kind of go into the clouds and come out of the clouds. It wasn't bothered with any fighters. They were there, but they just never did pick us up. And we threw out all of our ammunition, threw out our guns, threw out our flak suits, anything we could gather up and throw it out. Still losing altitude. So the pilot said, uh, talk to the navigator. And he said, I don't think we can get back to England at, at the rate of descent we're having. And uh, that we may have to bail out because we're still, still in Germany. I said, well, I'm going to go back and see if I can't drop the ball turret. I got the turret operator out of the turret, and somebody had stolen my little tool pouch I had. So I took the fire axe, and I was beating those bolts off of the fire axe. All this time, we're still going down. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on in the, in the cockpit because I was too busy working. Next thing I knew, he said, uh, get in your ditching position. So I run up in the radar room and laid down, you know, and and uh, that thing hit the ground. Blam. 
And I thought, well, we're, I think we're down. I think we're going to be out, right, you know. I went to get up, and that thing, blam, hit again, and went, started giving it this. I thought it was beginning to roll over. I got a hold of stuff, holding it, you know, and that thing had given it this. And it kind of stopped, settled like that, you know, and I got ready to get up, and bam, it hit again. That thing was just bouncing, you know. Finally, finally it stopped. Well, I ran down to the, to the waist door, got out, and got on the ground. When I did, we had a co-pilot that was a big man. He played football for Cornell University, played one of the linemen, a big man. <coughs> he'd crawled out, he'd crawled out that cockpit one, had a backpack on. They had a little, they had a little one air backpack. You could fit real snug where they could, like, kind of like a backrest, you know. Well, he crawled through that window with that backpack on and, and dropped down to the, to the ground. <coughs> he was out waiting on me. And I said, how'd you get out so fast? And he said, I come out that window. I said, man, I bet you couldn't do that again in a, if you wanted to, if somebody paid you. But he, he's like the rest of it. He's trying to get out as quick as he could, any way he could. So it's in a turnip field with the wheels down. They told me this later. I didn't know what was going on with it. They had an air base there that the Canadians had taken over. This was the 13th day of September, and they had taken that over sometime in the first week of September. So we was trying to get to that air base and did get there, but they wouldn't let us land because the C-47s and the fighter planes were taking off. They said, you'd have to go around. And they said, we can't go around. We're coming down. So they, this one over the airport, over the airfield, went out there about a mile and set it down in a turnip field. <coughs> Pardon me. We ran to all that noise and stuff out here, and we, we went through a fence. We didn't just go through the fence, we went down the fence, flipping them poles off and wrapping that old four by four, what I call hog wire, around that wing, and uh, hung up in those old propellers, and we, and we finally got stopped. That's the, the condition was in. And we looked up, and here come a, what to call a weapons carrier. It wasn't done nothing more than a truck with a cloth top. And it had two Canadians in it. They come out across that field, we could see them. They came down there, and one of them said, um, uh, who was the pilot of that kite? And I pointed him out. I said, that fellow over there, they, they was over there looking, walking around the plane looking at it. And I never will forget, he went over and uh, uh, took his hand, patted him on the back, and he said, uh, a jolly good landing, jolly good landing. <laughs> I, can, I remember that one well. We went back to the base, they, we, they fed us, and we didn't have any, we had a flying tog drawn, that's all. And he took us to town and put us in, up in a nice hotel. And the people there were jubilant. They were still celebrating liberation. Everything was blacked out at night, but the, they bring the horses down and pray those old, big old footed Belgium draft horses and have uh, American flags and French flag, Belgian flags sticking out of their, out of their, uh, uh, their bridle. And the girls running around town with shoes on with little old flags sticking up out of, about that high, sticking up out of the shoelaces. And they were, I mean, they couldn't do enough for us. Uh, they, we went to a barber shop to get shaved and kind of get cleaned up. And uh, the barber, barber shaved us and then took us across the street to a little ice cream place and fed us ice cream. Wouldn't take any money. We had, we had worlds of escape money. French escape money, but it wasn't any good. Uh, the uh, when the Germans left, they took all the gold with them. It wasn't nothing. The money, the French money, wasn't any good. But we had about we had about eighty dollars in uh, English money, and they said they would, you know, said they'd accept that. So we bought trinkets to bring home to our family from from Belgium. We spent a, spent a couple of days there, and they flew us out in a C forty seven. Took us back to England, and uh, I didn't know it till years later. One of the fellows in our bomb group is a <clears throat> did a little research at the archives, and he got all these records that, that was compiled from the 493rd bomb group, and they had, they were getting ready to send us to a rest home, and they had a what they call a, a maximum effort 
That's for everybody to fly all the planes they could fly. So we, they put us back in the flying status, and we flew four more missions. Then instead of going to the flak home, rest home, they sent us back to the States. I had 28 missions. I flew 20 missions in the B-24, flew eight missions in the B-17. And I, I was telling some fella here a while back about it, and at the reunion here, and he said, which plane did you like best? I told him a story I just told you about getting shot down. I said, now you can, you can answer that for me. He said, I imagine it'd be the B-24. I said, you're right. <laughs> flew 20 missions, got shot up a lot of time, but never did get shot down. And uh, I never was as, never was comfortable in a B-17 because of, I didn't know much about it. Uh, we flew our 20 mission in a B-24. It wasn't only me, a lot of guys felt just like I did. We had a little training. Um, it didn't make any difference to a radio operator or a navigator or a bombardier. It's all the same to them. Same bomb site, same radio, navigation the same. But uh, pilot and engineer, you had to, had to learn to diff about a different airplane. A B-24 was a primarily a hydraulic plane. And B-17 was a primarily electric. And as uh, far as the pilot's concerned, you're going from a tricycle landing gear to a tail dragger, wide wing versus a narrow Davis wing, and they flew, flew different in formation. B-17 B flew much easier than a B-24. B-24 would just wear you out. And it, in fact, the pilot, it wear both of them out because they had to swap off so, so often. But uh, that, that was my feelings about the two, two planes. They're both good planes. The B-17 got a lot of print. It was pretty plain, looked nice flying. B-17 was ugly. And they, uh, you heard all kinds of story about, uh, uh, they looked like the crate that the B-17 came in, you know. Uh, but it was a good airplane. It was ever, they had an ever, ever phase of the war and every theater that there was a B-24 there. And fly further, fly higher, fly faster, bigger load, but it, one, one trip, one trip we had a uh, problem with uh, uh, one of the regulators, uh, the pilot's regulator uh, stuck open, he couldn't shut it off, and he called me out of the turret, I come down, he said he had it off his mask and he had another mask on him, had that, had two stations there close by just for that purpose. He is operating off another station, that, and that oxygen just pouring out of there. And I still, I, I didn't ever did bring it with me. I got a little one piece of one eighth, one eighth cable about that long, had a hook on each end of it. And I took that, I doubled that mat. The, the, all, all the oxygen was coming right out of the, end of the mask. I could close that mask, you know, pinch that mask off, and it'd go right out the bottom where the holes was. So I took that hose and doubled that thing up and twisted it around that mask. I couldn't stop the leak completely, but I could stem the flow uh, 75%. And I put that one-eighth cable around it with that hook on it, and I girded that thing up and put hooked that thing in a, to the one of the ribs on the inside the airplane and girded it back as tight as I get. And, and just as luck would have it, another rib would happen to be in the right place. And I had them hook, two hooks on those two ribs, that thing girded. And I stemmed the flow. And we, we were able to stay on oxygen until we got out of enemy territory and got over the channel. And then we had to let down. Otherwise, we'd have had to let down over Germany. That's about the, that was the only, only time, only instant of, we had a problem with the oxygen. Yeah, when they, but we never, we never turned back because of mechanical problems or because of any individual uh, on a plane, uh, you know, that was uh, sick or... Well, at one time we did have a, had a, our ball turret gunner froze his hands and his guns jammed and he was trying to work on it. He took his gloves off, which is a strictly a no-no. Took his gloves off so he could work on it. Hands froze and we had to crank him up out of the turret and get him up inside and put him in a blanket. Uh, but we didn't go back. We was already deep into, into Germany. Or maybe it was France on that trip. <coughs> Pardon me. But anyway, we got him comfortable. Uh, he, was, he was in agony. We got him comfortable and uh, 
come on home and took him to the hospital and he he missed uh, oh five or six missions. He liked to lost his fingers, but they they managed to save them. But everything, all skin peeled off of him. He was uh, a long time getting over it, but he did recover, fully recover. The radio operator, uh, his duties was not only a radio operator, but his duties was to um, throw out the chaff. I don't know whether you're familiar with that or not. But he come in little bundles, about that big around, had a little kind of like a string you could pull it and had a little chute there about that big. He'd stick at a bundle of that in a chute and pull that string and they'd just suck it out in the, in the air, you know, like scattering wheat. So he was down on his knees and uh, when he got on his knees, this old uh, flax suit would hang down and kind of be cumbersome, so he took it off and laid it down on the floor and got his knees on, on top of that and he was throwing that chaff out, and that uh, slug of that anti-aircraft fire, uh, it was probably that long, about as wide as your two fingers, came up through the bottom of the ship and hit that flak suit. He was kneeling down, hit that knee, or, knee on the inside right here, kind of come in like that. Hit that knee, and uh, he said, of course, the first reaction, it just knocked him backwards. He said, I've been hit. And, uh, and he was moaning, I could hear him. He still had the, had the mic button uh, open, and he, I could hear him mo moaning back there. And the pilot said, go back and check on him. I crawled out of the turret and I went back there, you know, and, and uh, it, it knocked a hole in his, uh, in his electric suit and everything. So I just took, pulled, the, pulled the plug loose from his boot, and I pulled that thing up. And it, it was just a red as fire where it hit it, and didn't, it didn't even break the skin. Kind of like you hit something with a club, you know, but it's it red. And that, that piece of flak was red hot when it hit him, you know. But it didn't, uh, it didn't, it didn't do any damage, it didn't get a purple heart or nothing, which was good, he didn't. But uh, we kid him a lot after that, you know. His knee, got, his knee was awful sore. He, he hobbled around, you know, for a while. But uh, I told him out there, man, if I hadn't had that flak suit on there, it went through that flak suit. But I said, if it hadn't been that flak suit, I said, it would have it ripped you wide open. But it, time it got through that, it was pretty well spent. And that, I take that, uh, somebody had one here today at the helmet, helmet. come down. Yeah. I'd put that thing on, and I, I, I'd try to get my shoulders and knees and everything else up in <laughs> Because I'd get it down there. It didn't get too heavy for me. A lot of guys complained about them being heavy and, and bulky and cumbersome. Well, it, it is, it was, but I couldn't get enough of them. Yeah. They were just, another little story about that helmet. I, when I first issued my helmet, uh, I was looking at that thing over how it was built and everything. And, was, and right under the inside, under the little old band, there was a, was a piece of paper. I pulled it out and the lady that, built that thing, put it together, had her name in it. And I, I often wonder whatever happened to that piece of paper. I, I, I thought, I, I'm a pack rat. I don't throw anything away, but I, don't, I never did know what happened to it. I wish I, wish I had it today. Uh, I, flew, uh, I flew a lot of my early missions on the, on the same plane, Baby Doll. One time when we weren't flying, another uh, Another crew flew it and uh, had the left landing gear, the tire was shot out on the left left wheel and they didn't know it. And when they came in to land, when they hit the ground, you know, the way of the plane, that went down, it, the landing gear collapsed and it came back, it rolled back and the wing dropped down and it, it ground looped. And they, but they took it and uh, to the sub depot and repaired it. It wasn't out of service too long and they got it fixed up. We flew it, started to fly it again and then someone else flew it and uh, uh, the nose gear, it collapsed. And uh, that time they, they took it to the sub depot and repaired it and brought it back and then we went through the 17 transition. And uh, someone else flew that plane for about one or two missions and then they went through the transition, they moved all the planes up into the 2nd Air Division, 
which is a 24 division. The reason why we started out with uh, B-24s, we were in a third bomb division, which was primarily a B-17 division. There was four, I believe, four bomb groups that B-24s, the rest of them B-17s. So they wanted all of them to be B-17s, and uh, they started uh, they, to change them over, but they couldn't change them over until we got enough planes. So when we got enough B-17s, they took all those 24s, put them in the second bomb division, which was a B-24 division. And then it made a, B, made a third division of B-17 division. It's hard to, uh, to mix the planes to fly because the, B, the speed of one plane and uh, against the other is constantly uh, 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 retarding or advancing your, your speed because you're catching up those B-17s. Then you'd have to slack off. Then you'd pick up. So it was difficult to fly a mission with mixed planes like that. We didn't know it was going to be our last mission. We didn't, we did, yeah, we didn't know. We came back and uh, they, they, they had, had 30 missions. You had to fly 30 missions then. It was 25 when we first got over there. And uh, before we flew our first mission, they raised it to 30. So uh, we were ex expecting to fly 30 missions. And then uh, we had our little incident, you know, of a uh, crash landing and uh, came back and we, and, uh, we flew flew four missions thinking we we're going to fly 30 and uh, instead of sending us up to the flak home they uh, sent us home all that's in the records and I've got a copy of it in my log book uh, so really I didn't you know we didn't have any idea that was our last trip which is good I think yeah. I'm looking for two, I'm looking ahead for two more missions yeah. not knowing that I'd already that I was going to come home so really it was a uh, it, it was it was a, a, a really a, a blessing like in disguise. I came back and went to uh, went to San Antonio, Santa Ana, California, at a recuperation center. And we all we did was just they, they, the Hollywood stars would come out and take a two or three bus loads down to Hollywood. We'd go to Hollywood Canteen, and uh, the stars would uh, would come in and. And cater to you just like you as a, uh, a king or uh, some fine country, you know. And we had tours all down through Malibu and all through on, on the coast down there. So we go out and just just loll around on the beach, and it would uh, it, you had three meals a day and eat any time you wanted to. If you got hungry sometime between meals, go in there and they'd fix you a sandwich. Treated just just you know just relaxed. Well, we had we were there about thirty days, and uh, sent me down to uh, uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. Boy, that's like leaving heaven and going to hell. Worst place I hate to say this. Worst place I believe a guy could go to. Uh, Walter Winchell. That's right. He called it Alcatraz of the South, and boy, he nailed it on the head. It's right down in the Mississippi swamps, and, you, and your shoes and your shirts would mildew from one day to the next, the old damp air, you know. So we were down just sitting there marking time, and they came in one day. It was, uh, this was uh, in a latter part of December, and I had scrounged around, and I got a ticket to the uh, Sugar Bowl football game for New Year's Day. I was kind of looking forward to that. And I was down around, down at the orderly room one day, and I a guy come in and said, Hey, uh, would you like to get out of this place? I said, You bet. He said, Well, they've got a, they're trying to get a, a certain number of people to go to Buffalo, New York, have to go through the Curtis factory up there on C-46s. And uh, I said, Well, I anything to get out of here. So I went down to the orderly uh, room, uh, and uh, they had a, a uh, little sergeant in there, and I said, where do you sign up to get out of this place? I want to go to Buffalo, New York. He said, just come with me. So we went down to, to the uh, squadron headquarters, and uh, I signed up, and we had about three days Well, they called me, and, and it, was, uh, it was about 25 or 30 of us went up there. When we got up there, there was about 60 people up there. Had uh, they had two 
two barracks. And uh, when we left, when we left Mississippi, some of the guys drove. They had to, they stopped by home, you know, on on their delaying route, and they had their family car. And they asked me if I want to ride. One group said, "You want to ride with me?" I said, "No, I'm gonna ride the train, the troop train." So we rode the troop train, and uh, we hit snow somewhere along Tennessee or Kentucky, and we got up there to. Uh, Buffalo, New York, I had 26 inches of snow on the ground. Went from one environment totally to another environment. And uh, we didn't see the ground all the time I was up there. We never even got a chance to go to class. Uh, the guy come around and uh, the, it was uh, wind was come blow that snow and it had, next morning they had to shovel the snow away from the door so you get out of that place. They come around one day and said, uh, you guys are going to have to sign these papers so you're going to go fly the hump. When you get through your class uh, studies here, so you're going to be here 30 days, so you're going to, we're going to send you to China to fly the hump and uh, sign these papers. And I said, I, I, I'm not signing nothing. Oh, you got, man, you got to sign this. You know, you're going to get in trouble. I said, if they want me to fly the hump, all they're going to do is say, here's your order, you're gone. I said, they didn't ask me to sign anything to go to Europe. They just sent me. Well, do what you want to. I said, I'm not signing. Well, there's, there's four or five of us didn't didn't sign the paper. It's volunteering. I know, you know, just strictly volunteering. I said, th I thought I'm not going to sign. So we didn't, and they took us took us out of that class. And uh, I worked down at the depot for the U.S. Postal Service, unloading mail out of them baggage cars that had been snowbound. And they paid me for it. So I'd get an army pay and get in, uh, in uh, uh, mail service pay. I did that for about two weeks. Then they come in one day and said, uh, they give us a, a, a list of five places. Uh, Langley Field was one of them. Boca Raton, Florida was one of them. Chanute Field was one of them. Scott Field was another. And said, where, where would you like to go? And I said, man, I, I know how this army works. You, you say, I want to go here, they're going to send you to somewhere else. But anyway, I said, I'd like to go to Langley Field. And uh, <clears throat> that's where they sent me. So I stayed at Langley Field and uh, training, training bomber crews. There were three of us signed to a plane. We flew every third day and we maintained this plane. And, but you had, a, you had a different crew every time you flew. Didn't fly the same ones twice. And uh, that got kind of touchy and spooky. Uh, didn't know who you were flying with. Or, and we had a lot of, lot of nair uh, escapes, you know, from night flying. And it's kind of nerve wracking. So I, I, I got out of that as soon as I could. And uh, then I had, they gave me a crew of about five mechanics. And about all we did was just, <clears throat> work on airplanes till the war was over. So I was in I was in Langley Field, Virginia, when the war ended. What did you do? Uh, what was your occupation after the war? I came back and went to college, and uh, <clears throat> I'd worked. I told you I was an apprentice for the railroad. Mm -hmm. I came back and went. To, uh, got all my all my uh, pre med. I wanted. To, I had aspiration to be a dentist, and. Uh, but I couldn't get in dental school. We didn't have a school in Arkansas. I had one in Memphis, one in Dallas, Texas, and St. Louis had a dental school, and so did uh, so did uh, damn, so did uh, Kansas City. They had a dental school, but I couldn't get in. They're taking their own state people. They, they had, they, that's from 1947, and they, they accepted me for 1952. So I, I was married, I got married, and uh, uh, expecting our first child, so I went back to the railroad. Worked for them 43 years, Dent, and, I, and I never regretted it one minute. I, they, when my time come to go to dental school, they, you know, sent me, they sent my papers to me and everything, and uh, in fact, I'm going to go to Loyola, and uh, 
I'd, I'd already established myself with the railroad, I just didn't go. So that's about the, that's about, I, I, when I retired, I worked 43 years with them. I've never met anyone that worked for the railroad that doesn't love it. And well, it gets in your system. Um, my dad was a railroader, and uh, had, I had uh, two brothers a railroader. When I first went to work for a railroad in, uh, when I finished high school, I was making 39 cents an hour. And I had a brother that was working for this building a, 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 a it was an armory uh, about 40 miles away. And he told me, he said, you need to quit the railroad and come down here. He said, I'm making $40 a week. And I was making 39 cents an hour. And I said, no, nah, I, don't, I don't think I'd, he was an electrician. And uh, I said, no, I think I'll stay with the railroad. But I, I went on up in the railroad and did good, did good. Well, that's a great, a great interview. Thank a you.